NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. CDT is a nonprofit group in Washington, D.C. We have an office in Brussels. We've been around for about 25 years working on internet freedom. That makes us, uh, I guess, kind of a grandfather in internet times. Um, I've been asked to talk about recent changes to law enforcement access to digital evidence with a focus on the Cloud Act and the GDPR. Uh, that's the General Data Prote Protection Regulation that was adopted by the European Union. I'm gonna start with the Cloud Act then turn to GDPR, and then talk about the interplay between the two. So the Cloud Act became law in March of 2018. It begins on page 2201 of a, of a bill. That means that the Cloud Act was tacked on to a spending bill um, that had 2,300 pages. And it was done at the last minute. That also means that there is not a complete legislative history of the law for you to figure out what it means. Uh, the Cloud Act had two purposes, and the first was to facilitate cross-border demands by law enforcement entities in the United States, and I think that's the one most relevant for uh, defense lawyers, and the second was to facilitate cross-border demands on U.S. providers by law enforcement entities abroad that are in countries that have reached agreements with the Department of Justice and I'll talk about that second. First, with respect to U.S. demands, the Cloud Act answered the question about whether U.S. process um, in the ECPA context has extraterritorial reach. The answer is yes. Effective immediately, um, federal entities and state and local entities to the extent the law permits them can issue demands for content and metadata on U.S. providers, um, that is providers um, within the jurisdiction of the United States, for data that is within their possession, custody, or control, no matter where the data is located, no matter whether it's in the United States or whether it's located abroad. Um, and um, don't feel uh, like you have to write all this down. It'll be in the materials, in supplemental materials that uh, will be available to you. The Cloud Act mooted the Microsoft Ireland case. That was the case in which Microsoft challenged a warrant for communications content that Microsoft stored in Ireland. The Cloud Act mooted that case just before the Supreme Court was to decide it. What's the effect of this portion of the Cloud Act? Um, law enforcement in the US can reach into foreign data centers of US providers by compelling the provider to disclose the data that's located abroad. Another effect is angry foreign governments. They don't like it, the idea that a foreign uh, law enforcement agency could compel a disclosure of communications content that is held on a server in their territory. Another effect will be more conflicts of laws. I'll talk later about the conflict with the GDPR but the law will put providers between a rock and a hard place. Um, they will be compelled to make disclosures that are prohibited by another country's law, and, and those um, conflicts will be resolved in U.S. courts based on common law comedy analysis. Um, with respect to U.S. demands, criminal defense lawyers should keep in mind that the location of data abroad is now a lesser impediment to law enforcement access by law enforcement entities in the United States. Brady material may be in that uh, data, but there's no new mechanism for defense lawyers to affirmatively obtain that material from the providers. They can only obtain it from uh, Brady demands made on the prosecution. Uh, and this is, again, with respect to content. The Cloud Act has a separate part about foreign demands. These are demands by foreign law enforcement agencies in foreign countries. The, the Cloud Act permits the Department of Justice to enter into agreements with foreign governments 
that will permit those foreign law enforcement agencies to make direct demands on US providers, on providers like Google, Microsoft, and Twitter. These demands under the, under the statute must be targeted and particularized. Again, they're made on US providers, but they're made under foreign law, and this is the big difference from the MLAT system. In the MLAT system, the demand from the foreign government gets channeled to the Department of Justice. Justice goes in front of a court, and it demands, uh, asks the court to issue a warrant based on the information provided to it. Probable cause is required. That is not the case going forward for Cloud Act demands made by foreign governments that have reached agreements with the, with the US. Instead, they will proceed under the foreign law. And the foreign law generally, always, does not require probable cause. Um, this is more about communications content than it is about metadata. Under ECPA, US providers can voluntarily disclose metadata, including traffic information, to foreign governments, regardless of whether the metadata pertains to an American or not. So they don't really need the Cloud Act agreement for the metadata. They can get a voluntary disclosure of that now. Uh, so the focus will be content, but the content can be stored or in real time. That means, and this is new, foreign governments can, with the assistance of a US provider, engage in wiretapping on US soil. There are important limitations to this. First, the target cannot be on US soil. What does this all translate into? It means the demand goes to Facebook, for example. Facebook makes a disclosure in real time about a foreigner who is abroad from a, ser from a server that could be within the United States. Okay, that's the bottom line here. The demand goes to the US provider, but it has to pertain to a person outside the United States and to a person who is not an American. That is, they're not a citizen and they're not a resident of the United States. Importantly, particularly for defense, for the defense bar, the Cloud Act permits a share back from the foreign government that has obtained this content without going through the probable cause requirement. It permits a share back to US law enforcement of information that was obtained. That share back can include the communications of Americans who are speaking with the target, okay? This is perhaps the most important thing to keep in mind, that the Cloud Act will permit the foreign government to share information back to the United States law enforcement entities about information about Americans or people in the United States um, through that, that, that has been intercepted uh, or collected from storage without probable cause. Which countries have agreements? None. That's good news for now. It's not gonna last. Um, there will be an agreement um, soon with the United Kingdom. Um, we have heard that what's holding up that agreement with the UK, which has been negotiated for about two years now, even before the Cloud Act was law, that the death penalty is holding it up, that the US wants to be able to use the information it obtains under the agreement from British providers in death penalty eligible cases, something that it can't do right now under the relevant MLAT with the UK. Which countries can get them? The countries have to meet basic human rights standards that give uh, the Department of Justice a lot of flexibility in making these decisions. And um, those human rights standards have to pertain both to the surveillance conducted and to due process within the legal system. Also, the foreign government has to agree to reciprocity, meaning that the US can make the same kinds of demands that the foreign government can make. So criminal defense lawyers, as I said, should look back for, should look um, out for the share back to US law enforcement. Um, reverse targeting is prohibited. That means targeting the foreigner abroad for the purpose of collecting the communications of a person in the United States or a person who is an American. And they should look out for tasking. It's also prohibited. Tasking is when the US government asks the foreign government to do this collection, particularly when, for example, the US government couldn't meet 
the probable cause requirements in U.S. law. Remember, foreign law is generally more friendly to law enforcement than is U.S. law. Um, there's a provision that says orders can't violate the right to free expression. It's not really explained in the statute, so I can't explain it here. And uh, there's a serious crime requirement. The foreign government can only do the um, wiretapping for serious crimes or the collection from storage for serious crimes. Serious crimes are not defined in the statute. So let's turn now to the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. It became effective in May, and it's self-executing. That means it is now the law in all EU countries. It's binding on companies that control or process data in Europe, including US companies, and it requires these data controllers to comply with rules on data security and data sharing. It does not directly um, bind the foreign law enforcement agencies. They are bound directly by the Police and Justice Data Protection Directive, and these foreign countries have adopted laws that implement that directive. However, GDPR can impact law enforcement and defense bar access to information. Let me give a couple of examples. The GDPR includes the right to be forgotten. It gives individuals the right to have personal information erased within 30 days if the data is no longer necessary for the pur purpose for which it was collected, if the individual is objecting to marketing to them based on that data, I want the right to be forgotten here, um, and if the data was collected based on consent. There are other reasons. I think these are the most important ones. The impact on law enforcement and the defense bar will be that data once available no longer is available. Here are a couple of examples. The Whois database. Whois is a database of sellers and owners of domain names. www.cdt.org is the domain name for my organization. The Whois database includes contact information and other personal information that allows the police to get access and to attribute crime. After GDPR, reg registrants' personal information was pulled from the online public-facing database, making it now more difficult for law enforcement to attribute crime and making it more difficult for a defense attorney to find out who is behind a domain. Here's another example of the right to be forgotten, a disappearing court document. This Frenchman, um, Bougeldon, he was sued in federal court in North Dakota for real estate and securities fraud. He issues a right to be forgotten demand to Plainsight. This is a site that hosts court documents. His demand, remove my name from the docket. Here's the demand that he actually sent to Plainsight. I've reproduced it here. Um, it it uh, thanks you for deleting my personal information, my name, from this court docket that you have posted on your website. Um, he helpfully includes his uh, ID card, and he helpfully uh, tells uh, Plainsight that, by the way, Pacer has already complied with one of these requests. So Pacer actually deleted his name upon his request. Um, um, this was an improper request under the right to be forgotten. He doesn't actually have this right, but companies often find it easier to comply with the demand than to fight it. And that's probably what Pacer did here. So I said I'd close with a, a slide about the conflict of GDPR with the Cloud Act. GDPR is sometimes going to require data controllers, US companies like Google, not to disclose personal information about EU residents, including US citizens. But the Cloud Act allows US law enforcement to compel US data controllers like Google to make disclosures that would be prohibited by the GDPR. This will create more conflicts of laws. Providers can seek to quash the US process in US court, or they can make the disclosure under a GDPR exception. It's not yet clear how these uh, conflicts are gonna be resolved. Stay tuned, it's a new law. Thank you.